Insider. Music, dramas, movies, musicals, YouTubers, and more. Anyone who is anyone in their field, the insider of the bunch, joins us every Wednesday to share insight from their world on Insider. He is one of the most sought out foreign TV personalities in Korea is none other than Tyler Rush in the studio. Hi. Hi. Hi there, everybody. Thanks for having me today. And in Korean. Ah, 네 여러분 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. 타일러입니다. 이게 훨씬 더 자연스럽네요. Yeah, doing radio in English doesn't happen every day. So. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. No, trust me. Uh, when I first started working at uh, radio, mm-hmm. I English is my first language. Right. But I swear, I forgot who I yes. was. Yeah, exactly. Me too. I feel the same way. Right. Okay. <laughs> that, cool. That's how I feel today. Okay. So, okay. so yeah. Tyler, if you do not know, I think if you've ever watched a variety show mm-hmm. that had to do with anything that had to do talk about cultures or anything, yeah. Tyler's one of your main guys to see on the <laughs> panel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're super busy. Uh, today's mm. a holiday, so thank you so much, first of all, to yeah, be joining no, us in the studio. Thanks for having me, actually. Oh, yeah. I actually am super excited for today's show. Awesome. Um, so today is a holiday. It is Children's Day. Um, do you have any fur babies to go home to? or? Yes, actually, you do? I do. Um, so... I have a dog, and she is lovely. Uh, her name is Charlie. Aww. Yeah, and she's a Bedlington Terrier. She's eight months old <gasps> and super hyperactive and loves to play. So, yeah. Eight months. <laughs> yeah. You're at the crazy state yes, of... Yes, I am in the crazy state For a parent yes. mode. Yeah, she's been tearing up all sorts of things in my house. You know, I walk her a lot every day. I live close to the park. We go on like an hour walk plus every day. But despite that, she really likes wood, and she's taken to chewing she, on I think she's my furniture. Teething too. Yeah. I think she's probably yeah. teething, yeah. too. Um, my vet at the time told me that when they start to start chewing on things, to take ribbon or Ooh. any type of, like, rope mm-hmm. to kind of pull at their teeth so all the baby teeth can oh, fall out faster. Oh, okay. I see. And then That's they have a, a tendency tip. not to, like gnaw on things. Yeah. Okay, good point. Oh, I love how this is just going to be like us talking about <laughs> random topics. Best yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dropping by one of our loyal listeners, fam. Tyler's in the studio, so you can start sending any random questions in for today. But um, first of all, um, Children's Day is not a big thing for the States. Mm-hmm. But, you know, right. you're in Korea. You kind of get used to the customs and stuff like that. Right. Do you call home? Is there like a niece mm-hmm. or nephew or anybody that you like call and be like, happy Children's Day? I don't actually. You know, I've never for me, you know, I came to Korea in 2011 and Children's Day wasn't something that you really run into so much when mm. you're like when I was at, in grad school, right. you know, like right, as a right, student, right. like not the the other students around me don't like have kids. Right, you know? right, right, right. And t- people are too old to be like, oh, I'm a kid. So. Right. <laughs> well, we want to, but. Right, yeah. <laughs> so more than, more than Children's Day, like Teacher's Day Aww. was a thing that I sort of adopted a little bit more. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I, d- I don't really call home, but I do have uh, two really adorable uh, I have a one niece and one nephew. Aww. And, yeah. So I talk to them on occasion anyway. So. Okay. Yeah. So not just because it's, you know, Children's Day, exactly. you just get a chance to say hi. Right. Um, okay. Now, honestly, I, I've, if I say Tyler mm-hmm. in, to anybody in Korea, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> honestly, there's probably nobody that doesn't know you. Um, to the point where, like, you just, just, even though you've done a lot of, like, cable programs, mm-hmm. you've also done, you just, you're pretty much everywhere. I've done a lot of really different stuff. That's right. True. So you're yeah. kind of everywhere. And so, I mean, there's, you stand out as it is, because mm-hmm. us foreigners do. Yeah, we we do true. kind of stand out in good, Korea. Yeah, good job. Yeah. <laughs> and true. it's very true. And like everywhere we go, they're like, oh, you speak really good Korean. And right. so we stand out anyways. Mm-hmm. But obviously now that you are doing TV and you're like a TV right. personality, you kind of become a celebrity. Mm-hmm. So is there any pros or cons that you've kind of oh, realized yeah. over the years? I think, you know, at first, um, I'll always remember when I first started that program, my first TV show was Bi Jong Sang Hye Dam, mm. non summit or abnormal, uh, abnormal summit. summit or what, what you may call it. But when I first started that, a friend that I was going to school with, she turned to me and said, You sure you want to do this? You know, if you do it, you can't go back. And I was like, 
I'm going to be fine. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're paranoid. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? I'm just going to like, I'm only going to do it uh, you know, for a few weeks. They, right. they say it's only happening for a few weeks and then I'm done. I don't know what you're talking about. And then, you know, one thing led to another and it became like a whole career and everything in my entire life just changed. Um, but, you know, good, good sides, bad sides, you know, it, it has everything to it. Um you know, if you know you're in the bathroom and the person next to you is like, "Hey, you're Tyler," and you're like, "Can we finish and then like talk about this outside?" You know, <laughs> the, there are situations where it's super awkward, right? right, and uncomfortable, right? Or you have a bad day and you're like, "Or you know, you're not feeling well. You you might you have like a flu, or you're gonna, you know, you need to get home as fast as you can." Um, days like that when somebody's like, "Oh, hey, I know you," and you're like, "I really can't talk right now." Right, like those times are hard. Right, but but. On, you know, just in in the grander scheme of things, there are so many more benefits mm. to having a public profile. And I'm able to do and try new things all the time. Uh, and people are much more open to talking to me and, and listening to what I have to say. And I get to develop a close relationship with not just one or two or 10 or 20 Korean people. But I get to develop a relationship with the country right. as a whole. Right, and right, that's right. like a whole new experience. It's really fascinating. I've learned a lot from it. Okay. So yeah, you brought up your first show. And I feel yeah. like, I yeah, like you said, probably the writers and everybody's like, oh, it's only going to be three weeks. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you saw the concept for the show, I mm-hmm. mean, it was a it would probably ask a lot of question marks. Like, would mm. the viewers like something like this? Right. Will this be able to become a regular thing? Yes. They probably didn't think too much of it. Yeah. But yeah, it did really take off. So when, how did they initially kind of reach out to you mm. for Abnormal Summit? That's a really good question. So um, when that program was being planned, actually the person who designed and planned that program She herself went to do um, some sort of like language study abroad very briefly in the Boston area. Okay. And then after, you know, doing English classes and talking to people from other countries in English about random topics, she was like, this would be an awesome TV show. And then she started to develop that as the Bijong Sang Hedam format. So that's where it came from. Okay. Um, And so I think a lot of people in the media industry didn't believe that it would be possible to find enough non-Koreans that speak Korean well enough to have a debate. Right. Right. Which is not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. Because, I mean, even in your mother language, having a debate is not easy. (laughs) This is true. This is true. So there was sort of like a, a need to have a proof of concept for them. Right. But so they really started looking for people in ways that you don't really see happen with a lot of other programs, I uh-huh. think. Um, so normally, you know, they'd reach out to like Sosoksa or the, the entertainment companies and ask to, if they have any you know foreigners who could come on the show. But I, at the time, was a graduate student and I had a scholarship and my scholarship was running out. I needed some sort of part time job. I didn't want to teach English. Everything I was doing, I wanted it to be in Korean. So I asked a friend of mine from Indonesia, like, so what do you do when you find you know, part-time jobs in Korean? Where are you looking for them? She's like, oh, there's this website. Everything's in Korean and all the work is in Korean. Just like look at a few postings and send your resume. So that's what I did. You know, I went to that website. I looked at the postings. Everything, you know, so many companies in Korea are just uh, like... Um, English, uh, what do you call that? Initials of the company name. It's like, you know, KXQ or whatever it is, right? So I don't know what they are, but I'm sending my resume. And then later I get this phone call. It's like, hey, do you speak Korean? Yeah. Okay. Well, we want to interview you. So I go and it's me and then 13 people. Those 13 people are all writers. And they're all asking me these questions like, what are you doing in Korea? And like, <laughs> it's, are it's you like married an interrogation. yet? Yeah, it's a total interrogation. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, so what's really going on here? You know, I know this is like a job or interview, but like for what? And they're like, oh, we're going to have a debate in Korean on TV once or twice. Do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how I got into it. It was just, I, I really needed a part-time job. I didn't want to do something in English. It was pretty random. It wound up, wind, wound, wound up being a, a TV show. And instead of just being a pilot episode, it wound up being, you know. How, whatever. It, yeah, thing, yeah. Yeah. What ended up being it is. But honestly, yeah. Whenever I saw... The first pilot for this, one thing for us, because here mm-hmm. at Adidas, we're always searching for people who speak both languages mm-hmm. and who are able to, you know, have that broadcasting right. appeal because you do have to have it. Right. Um, That's true. 
yeah, I think we need to find out where that site is first. But <laughs> anyways, <laughs> I mean, when I was yeah. seeing it from the like production standpoint, I was just like, that staff like really probably like grinded their heart and soul and bones and like signed a deal with the devil to mm-hmm. get those people yeah. on that panel. Yeah, no, they tried really hard to find the right people. I think. Wow. But I mean, okay, so you said that, you know, it's supposed to only be a few weeks. It started off, right. you probably never pictured yourself going to grad school and then now being like a TV personality. So what happened from being just on that show to kind of doing more outside mm, of that? Good point. So uh, after being on that show for a few weeks, literally, I think we the third episode went out and all of a sudden people everywhere started talking about it. It was right. like this new crazy thing. And then there was this like whole push from other channels and, and advertising to try to get the people on our show to help out with ads or campaigns or whatever. And so it actually happened really fast. So in in 2014, June was when the first, I think, the first episode went out. Uh-huh. And then by the end of the year, I had gotten an offer to be on a TVN program as a permanent member of the cast, which okay. was 문제적 남자. Problematic man. Problematic man, yeah. So within the first six months, I got my second major gig in TV. And then once you're on two different channels regularly, then it just sort of... Keeps going, yeah. It just keeps going from there. That's so cool. Okay, now hold on with the whole (laughs) with the whole problematic men because I feel that even now a lot of like our listeners because that Mm. show is I feel a show that it doesn't need to necessarily be in Korean to be Mm -hmm. intriguing for somebody. Yeah, because it it challenges the viewers and you as a panel member. on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. So when they pitched you that job, what was their original like idea? Like, how did they yeah. pitch that to you? So actually, that program also was being, you know, it was a new program when I went on it. So the the PD who was developing that concept was working with the main writer to develop it. And they called me and they're like, we want to meet t- you and talk to you about this this program we want to do where it's like IQ problems, but like interviews and like all meshed together. And I was like, okay. So I met up with them and they, they showed me like a few examples, like these kind of problems, you know, like Mensa problems uh-huh. or IQ test problems. We want to like solve these together or like the, you know, major tech companies when you go to their interview and they're like, there's a dragon in the warehouse. How do you get to the other side? And you have to like, or they're talk really your weird. Way right. Yeah, these really weird interview right, questions. Right, right, right. So this is what they wanted to do on television. I'm like, I've never heard of this on TV. <laughs> this sounds awesome. Let's right. do it. <laughs> so, so I was like fully in, you know, from the get go. So pretty yeah. much, it's not so much that you like had a I like a deal like oh i'm i'm going to be like a tv personality no, i no. love this it's just both of those shows were just so different in yeah. concept that yeah i think i think really at the heart of it it was you know there there are actually more and more you know non koreans who are participating in media and i hope that trend continues um but there are not very many people who um who come here for like a scholarly purpose, like they really want to study and they're very academic. And then they also happen to have um, maybe public speaking skills and and they wind up being useful on television. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, I think I provided some sort of different kind of sauce that they couldn't really um, get from certain other character types that they had access to. And, And by having access to that, you know, then they could sort of craft these new programs, borrowing my image as a way to sort of kick it off. Mm. So if you were to, ex- I mean, everybody has different opinions on this, but if you were to take Problematic Men and it was just going to start with a bunch of Koreans and it's like smart guys solving problems, there are some sort of PR issues with right. that. Because right. Because it's not diverse. Right. And and it comes across as this kind of like, like hangyar, kind of like people, like, you know, only from a certain schools, you know, that kind of discussion. Then it just doesn't have the right brand image. Right. So you need something to break it. And I think my character provided that sort of segue into a different way of talking about being smart. Right. And we also had a few of our idols go in there, too, which exactly. actually helped yeah, that's th- that kind of break true. that stereotype yeah. as well. Because, right, if not, I feel that, like you said, the discussion would be like, oh, well, <laughs> what, are you trying to prove that their parents exactly. had a lot of money? Like, exactly. you know, yeah. I, I mean, if I can send my kid to private school, like, I feel right. that that conversation exactly. probably yeah. would have ended up But the diversity out. on the show mm. helped it to, like, 
you know, walk around that problem. Right. Yeah. Well, both of those programs did kind of give you a very like brainiac, Mr. Smarty Pants yeah. type of an <laughs> yes. ordeal yes, of an image. Yes, um, has that kind of worked against you in any situation? Mm. Like, have you found yourself in the middle of a conversation or maybe at like an event and you're everybody yeah. thinks like, you know, every uh, answer on the table, but it was just like. Uh? <laughs> yeah, right. So, I mean, my personality, I just personally don't have any problem with saying I don't know the answer mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I can't tell you I'm not an expert. So, like, I, I go to that really quickly when I don't know what I'm talking about. And I was I'm actually surprised people accept that very well. Right. Because I know? feel that, yeah, a lot of people probably wouldn't be able to kind of swallow that. Right. Mm. Yeah. So. Um, so, yeah, I haven't really had a problem with that. Um, but. Personally, on like a psychological level, you know, somebody might ask you to go and give a talk on something or, you know, the um, the viewer or the host of the event think that I am like really, really smart and an expert in that field Uh uh because of the image that I have Mm. in the media. And then, you know, they send me a request and we have to be able well, actually, like in this field, I can't really talk on this. Right, right, right. Right, So it's my responsibility to sort of pick and choose about what I can speak to. Mm. Um, And there is sort of a psychological pressure that you get when you when you show up at a public event and people like throw this really complex question question at you. And it's like, do you like should I expect myself Mm, to know the answer to that question? Yeah, Yeah. to know that answer. Okay. Well, fam, we're having a really fun conversation with Tyler in the studio today. I want to kind of get into how he came to Korea after a song break. Because, you know, all of us need to know that information. We're always, that's the number one question all foreigners get asked. And still, it's the most intriguing answer. How I got to, can you, sorry, can you ask a question again? Oh, I'm going to ask you after the oh, song break. Okay. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> I'm going to ask you after the song break. Don't worry. It's like, what question are we talking <laughs> uh, So what we're going to do is take another quick song break. It is Children's Day in Korea. We're bringing the inner child out with a fun conversation here with Tyler in the studio. So we've got Ha Ha singing Ki Takan Yagi, the story of a little kid, and more of our insider coming up after this. It's Insider Day here on K-Pop, and I'm your host, Dee Zak, and on this Children's Day... As you continue to listen to Daddy Young Radio, we've got, I feel, the most child at heart today. Tyler Rush is in the studio. He's given us such a upbeat, energetic interview as we're talking a little bit more about stuff. So there's a question that all of us foreigners get asked when we come to Korea and when we meet anybody who is Korean. Mm. When did you first come to Korea? But I'm, uh, al- I'm also genuinely curious, too, because yeah. as a foreigner, it's kind of different for all of us. This is true. Very true. Uh, I think like for some Korean Americans, it's different. Um, I've met some people who have come from like literally the middle of nowhere yeah. to teach. Like it just, the story is always different. It is. So, Tyler, what yeah. brought you to Korea out of all the countries in the yeah. world? Um, so I think my the reason why I came to Korea in the first place was for language. Okay. I love learning languages. You speak eight or nine? So that's a vague question. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, because, right? So for example, speak, uh, I definitely cannot speak uh, eight or nine languages. But, you know, for example, with Japanese, I cannot speak Japanese or understand it when I listen to it. But I can read um, like politics or news articles i know that sounds really weird but it's like fluent fluency in a language depends on how you approach that language right right right, right, no 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 no, yes 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 so yeah so for me i just i love language and like i could talk about it for hours and hours um but literally any language that i have interest in i immediately start to study and play and 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 sort of taste that that language so so you know french i grew up in vermont um, next to Quebec and so we learned French from a young age in schools so by the time I got to college I was doing like French literature and then I wanted to learn Portuguese so I started learning Portuguese and then people are like nobody speaks Portuguese in America you should learn Spanish so I started learning Spanish my dad is from Austria so I wanted to learn some German so I took German classes and so on and so forth and eventually you know learned a little bit of um, Korean by myself found it to be fascinating because the language structure is so different. It forces your brain, literally your cognitive experience is different because of just the structure of the language. And that was just, that tasted so good to me. <laughs> so I had to learn it. So that's uh-huh. why I came to Korea. Is wow. In 2008, I came here 
as an undergrad student for like an eight week language course, and then went back. Then I moved here in 2013 to come to graduate school to study um, international politics uh, in the Korean language. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, it's a very different story, right? <laughs> Not only that, just like you, I mean, obviously politics is never easy uh, in your mother language. Sure. Because just the way that it's worded, I feel. Yeah. Because there's true. a lot of party talk. There's a lot mm -hmm. of legislations. There's just a so lot of true. there's a lot of words that you don't yeah. really use in your yeah. everyday basis. Right. And so I feel that in each language, that also kind of That's transfers true. through. Yeah. Especially for I feel if you're looking at Japanese and Korean mm -hmm. politics, you're going to be looking right. at a lot of the Chinese characters right. that are in exactly. there. Yeah. And so you're kind of naturally learning Chinese yes. at the same time. Correct. Right. So I went to Seoul National University. And when you do your your um, your MA in, they call it Weigyohak, right? Uh, it's international relations. Um, you have to sort of learn Korean diplomatic history. And when you do that, you know, Korean diplomatic history that's pre-modern is all classical Chinese. Right. Right. So obviously, you know, I couldn't read that. Right. But... Um, you have sort of the original text, and then next to it, you have hesokbon, or like the, you know, the analysis of that text. And they force you, like, you have to learn enough Chinese characters to understand where in the original text is the part that you're reading in the hesokbon, right? right? So it's very um, high-level language learning. I mean... Um, I even had to take a Korean course because I was a foreign student mm -hmm. in Korean college. And I was looking at the book and I got so frustrated because I learned language the other way, not mm. by reading and writing, just by specifically speaking. Yeah. And so when you throw me a more traditional book, okay, I'm just like... Wait, what is this? Yeah, like, right. this is not Korean. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah, I, I, I remember yeah. throwing this at my, like, just Korean friends. And I'm just like, tell me this is Korean because yeah. I don't know what they're saying. Yeah. I have right. no clue. What... So right. you just have, like, a natural knack. Do you feel that this natural, like, fascination with language is something that you were just kind of naturally born with as a gift? Or can somebody actually gain this as a skill? I think you can gain it as a skill. Okay. I think that language learning is is universal to humans. Okay. Um, and like, there's actually I'm, I'm fascinating this the topic, just fascinated by it. But it, there's a lot of misinterpretation of the research out there about language acquisition. Okay. So uh, you've probably heard from different people, you know, throughout your lifetime, saying if you're between the ages of three and what twelve or whatever, then in this period, you should be studying a foreign language because it'll absorb the fastest. And once you get past, you know, once you start to age, like for men over the age of 25, then you won't be able to learn, like all this stuff. Like right? your brain stops functioning right. in that area. Like it's too right. like, okay, yeah. So that is an improper interpretation of the original research. And the reason why is because in order to say that someone between the ages of, you know, three and 12 learns a language faster or better than someone between the ages of 18 and 30, then you have to have a large sample of both groups. True. And you have to give them the same curriculum and see how they adapt to that curriculum over an extended period of time. Right, 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 right. right. But the issue here is that you cannot account for the fact that people's brains change as they grow up in society and they get regular education in a school as you mm. learn math as you learn writing your way to learn is formed by that school right? right so by the time you're an adult it's not that humans by the time they reach 18 their brains have changed so much that they can't learn language by the time you've like changed reached the age of 30 you can't learn language anymore because your brain's too old that's not true right it's just false right? right but what has happened is that your brain has gone through a socialization process that that now thinks you can only learn certain ways you have ah. to write down the you have to write down the vocabulary list you have to use flashcards you have to you know have your reading session your writing session your listening session and your speaking session we like break it down into this process right that is actually not natural right so it turns out that with language acquisition whether or not it's your first language uh -huh. or your second language your eighth language whatever the human brain learns language in the same way, under the same conditions. Huh. You have to be, you have to feel a need uh -huh. to realize uh -huh. the word or the expression. 
Right. And I feel that um, I, I, I agree with this, too, because I've taught just like housewives. Mm -hmm. So like I've I've been asked to like do personal, uh, you know, like just tutoring times with mm -hmm. them. And I noticed that the way that I'm trying to teach them English is mm -hmm. what they can use when their husbands have to move to the U.S. or another right. English speaking mm -hmm. country, which is what they asked me to do. Right. And my homework is not necessarily to ask them to look up words in the dictionary, mm -hmm. to write something down. We're not going to be setting up sentences of how I did something or how right. is, what is, you know, all these other things. Um, and they're just like, I can't function this way. So I, <laughs> yeah. I, I get where right. you're coming out yeah. with that. Yep. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. So you feel that anybody can kind of work on that. Now, I know Absolutely. that you said earlier that you didn't really want to teach English when you're looking for a part-time <laughs> job. Yeah. But Tyler, to be very honest, you come up on my social media yes, <laughs> teaching English and you're on, are you still doing Young Tars morning yes, I program? Am. Yeah, yeah, I used to still listen to there. you on the way to yes. work. So you teach English. Right. This is true. <laughs> on I do. Many platforms yeah. these days. So how is your approach to this? Right. So that whole teaching English uh, process for me, I started to do that um, first with uh, Young Tar Hyung. Mm. So he just wanted to sort of meet and talk and sort of he'll we'll have a situation. And then he would try to guess what you would say. Right. And then we'd work through it together. So very one-on-one. Right, right, -on -one. Right. And I was I was okay with that because it wasn't, you know, like classroom right, English, right, right, right? Right, right, right. So, so I was like, this is cool. And then the online English teaching platform that you'll see me do ads for nowadays on your phone or, or wherever you're looking, um, that platform actually, they approached me through someone I know. And they have a very um, realistic... Mm. Uh, way of teaching the language that I really like. Okay. And I wanted to support them with okay. that because I felt that um, up until really up until that company ha had more influence on the market, up until that point, uh, the majority of English language education was extremely uh, um, exam oriented and almost used it in a way to sort of just uh, judge people. Right. Right. And I didn't like that the language was being used to categorize people right. like that. Um, and the approach was always just, you know, memorize this, memorize that, memorize this, memorize that. I didn't like that approach mm. to language teaching because I, do, I think it's wrong. Right. So this company, they're like, okay, well, we're going to take, you know, TV shows, cut them into tiny parts, give context to the user. The user will guess what's going on, try to figure it out on their own. If they can't, then we give them a lesson about why it is, what it is with the context, and then they can get exposed to and really live in that context through media. Right. I was like... This is awesome. <laughs> like, this is how we should be teaching language in the first place. Right, 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 so, right. So that then I was like, yes. And at that point, that company was a startup. They had, they Nothing. didn't have anything, mm. right? So, so I was like, okay, I believe in what you're trying to do and what you're trying to change. So I partnered with them, and and now they're they're huge. Right, and I see you yeah. everywhere, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. I know I I really like that approach too because I too agree. Side mm -hmm. note, just I really agree that language yeah. should be taken more. Like a, a game or, yeah, you know, exactly. something more interesting. Yes. So uh, you're not only using your platform to being on, like, you know, trying to help people out mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but you also write up. You write books. Yes. Yeah. I wrote, I wrote a book. So, and yeah. and it just yeah. recently became a bestseller. Yes, it did become a bestseller. So yes. let's, I'll give you some time to kind of PR sure. about it. So what was that? Right. So um, I, in 2020, in uh, July, I published a book called... The English title is There's No Second Earth, uh, and it's about the environment. Right. So it's a series of short essays uh, that sort of mix both my background as a Vermonter growing up really in the middle of nowhere in nature and becoming interested in the environment and the earth, as well as my concerns about the environment and the actual scientific facts behind climate change and why it's a crisis and everybody should care. And that's just in a very, really easy way uh, to read and understand. Mm. And the book is also 100% Forest Stewardship Council approved uh, paper. And it's very So what does that mean for people yeah. who don't know what sure. that is? So um, in, 
in most situations where you have a uh, paper from somewhere, you don't know where the paper comes from. Right. Right. The paper could be from, you know, a forest in the country you live in. It could be from another country. It could be, you know, from a forest that has a bunch of endangered animals in mm. it. It could be from a forest that's using slave labor. Right. There's no way that you're going to know unless it's certified. Right. So this thing called Forest Stewardship Council or FSC is an international certification to make sure that the paper is sourced and produced sustainably. Okay. So there are no, so if you're using FSC based products, whether it's paper or a paper bag or it's packaging for a makeup product uh -huh. or maybe it's, it's, you know, a soy milk carton, you know, if it has FSC on it, mm -hmm. that means that the trees or whatever was taken from the forest to make that product wasn't taken from somewhere with endangered species. It did not destroy the forest in a way where it cannot be regenerated and it's not bad for the environment. Right. So it was yeah. sustainable. It's like it's a yeah. there was a balance there when it was yeah. yes, created. Exactly. There okay. are actually scientists that go out into the forest mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they test to see which species are in the forest, how healthy the water is. Mm -hmm. The overall ecosystem is monitored. Right, right, right. So the book was talking about the environment, but I wanted the book itself to also be a sustainable book. Hmm. And it was the first 100% FSC certified book from Jongap Chulpansa, these like large publishing companies in Korea. That's so cool. Yeah, Today you. it's like Tyler's here. We're just talking about some amazing topics and we're seeing so many things come out from it. Uh, before we go into a song break, since we're kind of talking about, you know, the environment, which mm -hmm. is a really big issue. At it the is. Moment, it is huge. Um, wherever you're taking your information from, it is a very big issue. Uh, one thing I was kind of, uh, it was a wake up call for me about two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. I had to go back to the States for a reason. And I realized how systematic Korea had put me into recycling because oh, right. of, uh, you know, we have our food waste that goes into a right. separate bin. We pay for it yeah. if there's an excessive amount. It's true. Uh, yeah. We also have, you know, plastics and we're getting we're breaking down that even more mm -hmm. at the moment. So there's a lot of things that the the government has kind of right. just naturally put on us that could be uncomfortable, yeah. but we're able to still kind of get ahead of the right. game in it. That's true. Um, as you've been living here, uh, and, you know, just either based on what you, is in the book, yeah. is there anything that we can still do? Because there's always yes. more that we could yeah. do. So is there anything else that we could maybe try to yeah. work against to kind of help right. out? So if you check out the book, there are actually um, 10 actions that you can take in your daily life that okay. can help out. But really, at the end of the day... Um, when you look into the math, in order to solve the environmental crisis, uh -huh. there are basically two actions that you have to take. Okay. Number one is when you vote. Uh huh. Do not vote for someone who it does not have a plan about the environment. Okay. It's that simple. Just mm -hmm. check if they have a plan or not. And if they have a better plan than someone else, that's great. Okay. You know, when you vote, exercise your right and choose a world that is better to live in. Okay. Right? That's number one. Number two is we live in a capitalistic society. We use money, and that money is just the same as voting. So when you buy a product, make sure to double check to see if there's a certification on the product, mm -hmm. to see if that company is making some sort of effort or not. Mm -hmm. If it's a clothing store, do they have a spot for you to bring your clothes back so that they can reuse them when they make another product? Right. Or, you know, if it's a fast food place, do they have a vegetarian option on their menu? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. If it's a cafe, do they have FSC certified cups mm -hmm. or not? Are they giving you the option to use a mug or not? Mm. You know, these kind of basic things. Is the person that I'm giving this money to using it well? Right, because if the consumer stops supporting places that yeah. don't, that particular right. place will change. change. Exactly. Because their numbers are right. going down. And that's just the logic of the system mm. that we live in. So okay. it's really important to support companies that are trying to make a difference. Right. I mean, because it's not going to happen overnight. No, not at all. So it was, as long as you can see, like, maybe one of your favorite brands, right. at least trying to make some type yes. of effort. Yes, very true. Okay.
So we're talking about the environment. We're talking about Tyler's life as a TV personality and so much more on our Insider for today. So if you have any more questions and messages, continue to send those in. In the meantime, though, as our Insider continues on, we got some more music for you to enjoy. A Pink is singing Kumal. Thank you. And more of our shows coming up after this. It's a second hour K-pop and on a Wednesday. Today is Children's Day. Orininar here in Korea. And we've got one of the most high energy insiders in the studio with me at the moment. Tyler Rash is here. We're talking about so many cool things. He has a book out. It's a bestseller. If you haven't checked it out yet, go check it out. Uh, we're talking about kind of his stay in Korea. So, so far mm-hmm. we talked about like, you know, how you came to Korea, how you got into broadcasting. Yes. But why are you still here? If you don't <laughs> mind me asking. <laughs> no, that's I a feel, good question. Because I feel that um, Korean Americans like just off mm-hmm. broadcast, we kind of joke around that Korea is a black hole. Yeah. And it kind of just sucks you in. That's. I feel like that's a really good expression because <laughs> um, even even for me and some of my friends who, you know, they came here for grad school and they went back home, they wind up coming back. It's the weirdest thing. It's right. like this space that Korea is this ecosystem has some sort of gravitational pull and I don't know why, but it happens. And I think, you know, my personal uh, assessment is that, uh, you know, Korea is was not really a very diverse place right. in the beginning, right? But like more and more and more different ways of thinking and living and all this kind of stuff are popping up. Right. And I think Koreans are more and more open to... thinking differently about their own lives. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of opportunity in the market right now if you want to, you know, try starting a new business. Right. If you want to, like I did, you know, write a book about the environment. You know, people will tell you, like, hey, I'm going to write a book about the environment. They'll be like, oh, my God, don't do that. It's not going to (laughs) sell. Like, it's a really bad idea. People don't like that that topic. But then I wrote the book and people loved it. It's a bestseller. So I think Korea is in this position where... um, It's really ready to taste new flavors and to try new things. And having access to a platform where if I want to try something new, that opportunity usually opens itself up Mm -hmm. means that I can do more here and try more here and learn more here and experiment more. So I think that's why I wound up staying. Mm. And your plans on staying are probably... I don't have plans. <laughs> so so I think by by default, like not having plans means I'm going to be here until I make plans to leave. <laughs> right, so. right. No, but and it's true. Uh, I We always kind of joke about it, but Korea is just so convenient to live in yes, as well. Yes, it is. Yes, um, sure. Whether you have a car or not, um, the way that our systems are set up with transportation, mm-hmm. with how everything is connected. Yes, it is a small country, but still, yeah. it just everything is very... compact yeah. and we're all right. kind of here yes that's so true yeah and the food is great the food is great yes this yes is, yes we originally had a food olympics prepared for you oh wow so we could find out your favorite foods awesome. but we're running over time okay so tyler yes on the show this is a promise that i have an excuse to bring you back in the studio awesome later down the line so we can kind Perfect. of quiz you on your favorite foods i and would stuff love like that. that this has been so much fun can i just <laughs> put that out there <laughs> Anytime actually... you want to do this again, just let me know. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, before you go, though, if there's anything coming up uh, that you want to maybe give out a shout out to the listeners, too, I'll give you some yeah. time to do that. Actually, so since, you know, we've been talking about the environment a little bit, there's a really, really big environmental conference, like super important environmental conference is coming up this year in South Korea. It's called p 4 g like the letter P, the number four and the letter G. It's a. big international conference where people from like CEOs from companies all around the world as well as heads of state are going to come together to talk about how to actually craft and implement solutions to the climate crisis. Okay. So uh, keep your eye out for that. You're probably going to see um, some information about that in your news feed. Maybe you'll see some stuff about it on TV. But when it happens, it's going to be really important. So check it out and I'll, I'll be partaking in, in the events as well. Nice. All right. Well, thank you, Tyler. You said on the show that you will be want- willing to come back. So yes. that's been recorded. <laughs> thank you for awesome. joining us. Happy Children's Day and we'll yes, see you next too. time. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Taking me out of the studio today is Tung Bang Shingi's version of Pung San Balloons. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. See you time to play.